as we're going through this stuff today, please don't, and like every week, don't ever hear any of this as condemning of you, even if you are, you feel like some of it might be speaking to you personally. <clears throat> this is not pointed at anybody. Again, like I say, I thank God, like genuinely, this is an a, a amazing uh, thing that we've not had to, um, like we looked at last week, that's one of those things where uh, in the church community, fallen leaders uh, is a massive, massive deal. Uh, and this week, we're going to be looking at, um, I've left, I left the church because it didn't meet my preferences. It's not been a story that's kind of well trodden at City Light, again, thankfully. Uh, although where it has been trodden, um, we've had people who have come and joined us and not liked the length of preaching or not liked the kind of preaching, being mostly trying to see what a scripture have to say, where the more used to wanting some sort of weekly injection of pump up or you can do it or you're amazing. Um, or people have come and found amazing community, but then uh, the, the music's not to their liking, too loud or not loud enough. Uh, too many young people or not enough young people. Um, too big or not big enough community, all these kinds of things. And yet in our discipleship groups, people have, the, the long tail of people leaving Sid Light is our discipleship groups where people go, oh, can I go to another church where I get the pump up or the demands are not as great or I'm not expected to live a vulnerable, open life with other people, but I still want to go to discipleship groups where I'm still really loving that community. Or the inverse, I love the in-depth Bible teaching that I get, but I don't want to go be vulnerable with people in a discipleship group. Uh, all, all kinds of things like this. Before we talk about this, I just want to mention that uh, even though we've looked at uh, why people leave the church and even abandon the faith, we haven't really even looked at what is the church. So we're going to be doing a little bit of that work today. Um, and last week, I know there was a lot of discussion after Dan came and preached last week about leaders who fall, leaders who fail. <clears throat> Feedback through discipleship groups. Uh, every meeting, basically, that I've been in since then, people have been bringing up either the, themselves hurts that they've had from their favorite Bible preacher or musician or famous someone who either went off and did something stupid or has abandoned the faith or has let them down in some kind of way, even from afar or many even up close, uh, people who have let, who've been like mothers or fathers to them who have um, gone and treated them poorly or abandoned the faith in, in various kinds of ways. Four things we identified kept coming up over and over and over again out of last week's um, sermon. A church that would promote godly leadership and we're not just talking about elders or pastors but every single person who has influence over another person like that someone uh, who even during the week was saying it was actually it was my father who abandoned me spiritually who 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 taught me one thing and went off and did something completely different for everybody in the church community who has influence over somebody else which is pretty much everybody Certainly every mother or father, every brother or sister, um, a anyone who's in community, who's trusted with somebody else's vulnerability, and we all have influence over others. And how do we, l what are some of the things we identified, again, just kept coming up over and over and over again, four things that lead to a culture, church culture, promoting godly leadership. And that is firstly that uh, there is a will to pursue Jesus and to kill sin that we actually as individuals and corporately want to do this, that we want to be a holy community, that Jesus made us his pure and spotless bride and is working in us and through us to make us into that pure spotless bride. We have a will to pursue Jesus and kill sin. Secondly, we have a culture of pursuing holiness so that it's not just a couple of individuals. Uh, when it's <clears throat> uh, one of my laments during the week uh, we had an elder candidates cohort during the week. One of my laments is, when we planted this church 10 years ago, there are a whole bunch of my contemporaries, so, so young people who are just in, like, in the early 30s who started to take over churches, uh, some, of, some of the larger or more kind of significant churches around um, Adelaide and even Australia. And kind of as we would, as a cohort, step into these positions of senior leadership, I remember having one-on-ones and small group discussions where we say, we are not going to make the same mistakes of our predecessors. 
We're not going to look for the platforms. We're not going to look to be worshipped. We're going to eschew the kind of celebrity, uh, charisma-led culture of uh, church platforms and then to see over a 10-year period, all of them buy into it because even though they wanted to, they had a will to, the cultures that they went into sucked them into this codependent relationship where the people in their congregations want to have a leader that they can wrap up some identity into, feel good about themselves, that charismatic man or woman of God, look at their amazing musicianship, look at their amazing oratory skills, great communicator, great preacher. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to do the work of the ministry anymore. They will do the work of the ministry and I'll feel great about it, sitting under their leadership. What a great leader I have. And the leader goes, wow, these people really love me. Maybe I am awesome. And like we looked at last week, uh, those small steps, the, the iterative kind of uh, mission drift where all of a sudden, oh, maybe I deserve something on the side. Maybe I deserve more money. Uh, maybe, I do, maybe I'll go find a bigger platform, etc., etc. We need the individual and corporate will to pursue Jesus and kill sin. We need a culture that we're all bought in on that does that. Uh, is humble, that pursues a godly, spirit-empowered humility. We need, thirdly, systems and structures, so that uh, ones that are bought into that culture, ones that support that culture, um, so that we have, um, like, for example, uh, again, I'm not trying to say, we've got it all, we've got it all together, we're doing amazing, but one of the, by God's grace, one of the things that we um, set up early on that is, helped us in this sense has been our discipleship groups where we don't have <clears throat> uh, pastors who become heroes that well I, I've got to meet with the pastor otherwise I haven't been looked after no I mean basically all of the looking after happens in those smaller communities I have baptized maybe 20 people uh, in 10 years at City Light out of the maybe 150 people who've been baptized because our discipleship group leaders and even discipleship groups baptize people because that, that they are their smaller communities. Pastoral care, we don't have a pastoral care pastor. We do have like, you know, escalation kind of structures and systems, but all pastoral care happens in the discipleship groups. The love and the care, the support, the discipleship happens in those groups. Again, so that we don't have this kind of hero worship. We, we've had times in the past where our website has ranked number one across stacks of different Google searches, where our podcast has been the number one podcast in Australia, for, you know, in religion and Spirituality, number one sermon podcast. Uh, and we've had amazing social media presence in the past. And all of those three things have led to unhelpful relationships with people outside of our discipling community. Where we, <clears throat> uh, because we didn't want to buy into the, let's grow a bigger platform and have a wider reach. And you might say, but what about like the gospel was going out? What we discovered was it was Christians embedded in other churches seeing our social media and going, wow, God's doing a really great thing there. I'm going to go bandwagon LeBron James style jump over to the LA Lakers. And I, I would be meeting with other pastors who are disheartened at, wow, you guys look like you're doing awesome and now I'm feeling disheartened. Uh, we stopped our podcast because, uh, you know, more thousands and more thousands of people who were listening to us, uh, we started to focus on those people. God had not called us to those people, he called us to make disciples. We found it was mostly actually uh, other Christians who were listening to that. And again, that's great, but there are far superior preachers to the ones we have, even though I think we have amazing preachers, don't get me wrong. Uh, there are, if people need to do that, there are other resources for that. Uh, even with our stream early on, we were one of the first in God's providence, one of the first churches to start streaming when the pandemic hit. We just happened to, in God's goodness, buy all of the equipment necessary like a couple of weeks earlier. Not because we saw the pandemic coming and the lockdowns coming, just we, we decided we were going to do some, some video stuff. <clears throat> and then when it hit, we, again, we started having thousands of people watching our thing. And all of a sudden, we started focusing on this broadcast rather than, we didn't, not rather than making disciples, but it started pulling us. And we went, you know what? Uh, we need to pull back. In fact, at the moment, we're not even, I know the camera's right here. That's so that we can, as a consolation, uh, record the sermon for people who aren't here. Uh, this time. So we, again, we need good systems and structures that are going to say, well, is a, 
It might be something good, but is it the thing that God is calling us to? Is it helpful for us right now, or is it just building us a platform where we feel good about ourselves? What has God called us to? And the fourth thing we discovered, uh, or we just we decided, or you know, uh, the thing that I kept hearing about was we need transparency, vulnerability, and accountability e- everywhere in the church. Certainly modelled among our elders and our leaders and our ministry directors, our pastors, our staff. Uh, volunteers, like ministry partners, but, but for everybody, again, it spies into the culture. Um, no, no good having a will to pursue Jesus and kill sin if you're the only one who wants to do it. No good being transparent, vulnerable, and accountable if you're the only one who wants to do it. We need a culture that, uh, where we all are brought into the same kind of thing. It's one of the hardest things, actually, about the last year for us as a church is for nine years, almost, eight and a half years, <clears throat> We grew a church, um, God grew his church from scratch, essentially. So we didn't have any existing sacred cows, didn't have any existing, uh, you know, can't move that pew, uh, can't do this differently because well, that's not how we've always done it. We've never done it, so uh, it doesn't matter. And then every time we've planted a church, uh, we've had fewer people in the church. And so we've had this, like, four or five times wonderful opportunity to just kind of get around each other again as a smaller community and go, all right, who are we now? What does God have for us in this next kind of thing? How has he resourced us? How has he made us as a, as a people? Uh, what, what has, what's the same as the call from before and what's different from before? Uh, but when we planted East last year, the very next week, 60 people, 60 like new people rock up the next week uh, and most of them stayed. And so we didn't have the opportunity to say, well, here's our culture uh, come, you know, a couple at a time into the, the existing culture and, and learn what we're about and learn what we're doing, we kind of had to go, all right, we're, we are a, in God's providence again. We're this new community and we have to figure out and fight for a culture of vulnerability, transparency and accountability where we're not ever trying to portray ourselves as heroes or as having anything together, <clears throat> but rather uh, we together as knowing sinners like we, 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 are, we are gospel people and the, like one of the core key tenets of the gospel is Jesus came because he loves us and he needed to come so he could die because of our wretched sin. So if we're, people, if we're gospel people, we, almost, we start with the love of God and the very next thing is Jesus had to come and die because of our sin. So there's no point in us pretending that we are sinless or don't have sin or, or are better people than we think we are or try to project this image of us having it all together because when the central tenet of our faith is God loves us so much he didn't want to leave us in our sin so he came for us and died for us to vicariously pay our debt and impute to us his own righteousness now I realise I haven't even opened the scriptures yet this wasn't even part of the sermon there's like the redo from last week's sermon but it is also the intro into this week's sermon as we look at How do we treat church not as consumers but as a blood-bought family of God? How do we do that? Because our Western culture uh, doesn't doesn't buy into this countercultural transparency, vulnerability, accountability, uh, systems and structures to pursue Jesus and kill sin. And unfortunately, the Western church growth industrial complex or culture also doesn't buy into the how do we promote and have good culture, good culture of pursuing Jesus, killing sin, eschewing a charismatic uh, leader-led but rather humbly, communally, uh, uh, transparently, accounta- uh, with accountability, and vulnerably uh, pursuing, humbly pursuing holiness in Jesus, the Christ likeness. Uh, so if none of the culture around us, even the Western church culture, isn't trying to do this, uh, the odds are stacked against us in doing it. I'm not saying, with, again, don't ever hear me say we're the only ones who are doing it right. We're not. Uh, we, we fail at this often. And, and thank God he has gifted us, people with that prophetic inkling to say, I don't think that's right. Or why isn't this happening? 
or why are we doing it this way? And we as a community have to go, oh yeah, why are we doing it this way? And not just the, well, I, I preferred it before, can we go back to before? But rather, uh, how do we step into that, again, blood-bought community that God has made us to be? So today's topic, I left church because my preferences weren't met. Again, uh, we've had people who have come through two theological sermons, not theological enough. Not, not really, they're not theological enough. Uh, but those people have been like, where's my one hour Bible study uh, when you have a 35 minute expository sermon? Uh, again, music pumping, too pumping, not pumping enough. Too many young people, not young enough. Uh, I'll come and join you when you move into a church building. Or are oh, you in a church building, feels too churchy. Um, not political enough, too political, too conservative, not conservative enough. People come with preferences looking for a, an institution or a, uh, a, a something, a body, abstract of themselves that they can come to and as a consumer receive or consume religious goods and services and then go back to their life. It doesn't cost them anything, and not to about money. No laying down of preferences, but just a, all of culture is directed to this, you're worth it. And you can find the relationship that's just for you, the one who completes you, actually. You don't have to change, they have to change. You are perfect, exactly as you are, how dare anybody suggest otherwise. We don't want to bend, not just other people to you, but we're going to bend reality to you and how you feel. And we've bought into this. And we approach church as this. If we treat the church as consumers, not as family, uh, both the church community, like we as a community, will pursue the things that comfort us. We can't move that pew. It's always been there. <clears throat> kind of this young loud young people around, they might break something. And also people coming into our communities will also be looking for their preferences. Oh, music's too loud, too soft. Oh, I'm going to go try somewhere else. I have kids in there gathering. I'm not, I'm not down with that. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Don't want to be vulnerable in a discipleship group. No, thank you. No, thank you. I'm not here to change. I'm here for my weekly injection of awesomeness affective music that makes me feel something and then I'm, I'm out, the, oh, hopefully some delicious snacks and good coffee and then I'm out the door. Again, not you guys. <laughs> not you guys. There are very good reasons to leave a church. There are. We haven't really spoken about heaps of them yet. There are very good reasons to leave a church. A, a, a non-exhaustive list. If there's a great kingdom opportunity elsewhere and you feel the call of God, and people in your community affirm that call of God. We've, people, we've had people who have left here even uh, this year, who are earlier in the year, who are for me and, and Beck like family, like little brothers and sisters who have moved to other parts of South Australia or interstate. We love these people. And when they've said, oh, we feel the call of God to go there, we're like, that seems like a good reason to leave a church. And we will grieve and we love you. And please come back. Um, that's, a, that's a good reason to leave a church. Or to go and plant another church. Uh, even if it's not just that, well, I have this strong sense of call over there. Uh, you, there is someone who else who has a strong sense of call somewhere and there's an opportunity for you and you go, you know what? Uh, I don't feel a call to stay or a call to go, but here's a great opportunity for me. I'm going to go join that missional endeavor or church plant. Uh, if a church starts preaching a different gospel, great time or great reason to leave the church. Church has poor systems which lead to lack of fruit or even sin and abuse. Great reason to leave a church. Uh, unbiblical poor or narcissistic leadership. Great reason to leave a church. Unhealthy focus or affiliation like political, for example, or theological can be a great reason to leave a church. Again, non-exhaustive list. So this series is not a you should definitely stay in a church and it's this church and definitely not leave the faith. That's not what this series is about. This series is about us helping, ourse helping ourselves, equip ourselves to understand why people would leave a church. 
or why some are even abandoning the faith. Not to build us up with arguments, to go and like bash them and, and prove them wrong. Like, yeah, we, we got you. But firstly, to, again, give us confidence in what we believe, to help us even examine ourselves and why and how we do church, how we can do it better. And also for us to lovingly come alongside others and, and by God's grace see some restored. That's the hope and the goal. So let me pray. How much longer do I have for this sermon? Like 15 minutes. All right, we'll do the short version. Let's pray and uh, we'll get stuck into it. Father, I'm, I'm so thankful for your church, the bride of Christ. I'm so sorry that we do it, we do it so poorly. We, we just collectively have made so many mistakes. Uh, we're supposed to represent Jesus well to the world and uh, we just, we just uh, fail and fall short all the time and I'm so sorry. Would you help us to love each other well, to, be, to love like Jesus and forgive like Jesus, to lay down our preferences like Jesus, not to stand for injustice, not to stand for um, destructive theology. Uh, Father, that's, that's not my request, but that uh, we'd be a home for the lost and the broken. We point people to you, to your love through Jesus. You'd equip us by a spirit for every good work. In Jesus' holy name we ask, amen. Uh, so what is the church? The church uh, in the scriptures, the church in the New Testament, uh, is this Greek word ecclesia or ecclesia. Uh, you might think that sounds like ecclesiastes or ecclesiastical, and yeah, it does. It does sound like that. Uh, so we're, it's um, a word which means uh, uh, an assembly or called out once, a called out company. So you guys, come over here, gather over here. That's a church, that's the ecclesia. Wherever it's used in the Bible, refers to people, never a building. We often say, well, I'm going to church or I'll meet you at church. And what we mean by that is the building where our church meets. It could be a bunch of people like Acts 19, uh, the children of Israel, Acts 7, the body of Christ, Ephesians 1 or Ephesians 5. Uh, we see the church, this word, the church used in three different ways. Firstly, the body of Christ. So um, the, the local body of believers. So uh, like the people in this room would say, this is part of the church that calls City Light Glengarry home, plus visitors, minus people who normally would be here. See this in places like First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, and Galatians. One secondly is defined as the body of individual living believers. So individuals, uh, First Corinthians and Galatians. Uh, so just a, across, say, Australia, the church in Australia. You're not talking about people who are called out and gathered in one place. You're talking about the the called out ones who are gathered or who gather in Australia, and then. Uh, thirdly, it's defined as the universal group of all people who have trusted Christ through the ages. So this is in Matthew 16, Ephesians 5 as well. So there, there's three different uses of the church, but it's never used to refer to a building or even an institution or a denomination. I'm not against buildings, obviously. We're meeting in one right now. Thank you, Jesus, because today is freezing and wet. I'm not against denominations or institutions where they serve the mission of God. Man, that, we, some institutions have done phenomenal work over decades and centuries. Some have devolved into churches of Satan, really. Uh, and thirdly, I think just everyone, everywhere who belongs to Jesus. Why is the church awesome? The church is amazing. I know probably for every person in this room, certainly for me, uh, the church has let you down. The church has, has failed you in some sense, whether that is in leadership or <clears throat> by culture or by systems or lack of, lack of discipling or for whatever reason, the church has let you down. Uh, I'm not going to cover church abuse this week. Again, uh, Harold's going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But just the normal, the normal ways churches, people let you down because again, the church is people, and people will invariably let you down. I'm not saying, well, 
stuff people then. Don't trust anyone. This is part of the, we still need to pursue that vulnerability. Actually, we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, church is, is people. Church is awesome because the church is the only institution Jesus ever builds and promises to bless. Matthew 16, he says, I will build my church. The church is Jesus' plan. It's his plan. He's building it. You, you guys are Jesus' plan for the world. That's why he has brought you here. That's why he's brought you to one another. That's why he has given you his Holy Spirit. That's one, one of the reasons he's given his Holy Spirit. It's one of the reasons he has sent you out into the world because his mission for the world is to build his church. He is building his bride. Secondly, the church is awesome because it's Jesus' only plan and his plan can't fail. So Matthew 16 again, uh, I will build my church, church, Jesus saying, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. And Hades, here referring to death, so often you might hear this translated, the, power, the gates of hell won't overcome it. It's bad translation. Uh, it's Hades is the word, uh, the place of death saying, not even death is going to stand in the way of me building my church. Jesus' death didn't stand in his way of building his church. And his church members, freshly minted church, all of the apostles die. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. We went to the prosperity gospel. Almost all of them die for the gospel, for, for his church. And you know what happens Almost every time the church is persecuted, the church grows. Almost every time people are killed for their faith, the church grows. Death does not stop Jesus building his church. You know what slows down? This is not in my notes. You know what slows down building the church? It's when the church aligns itself with political power. Every flipping single time. The church becomes powerful. The, the church grows slower. When the church is persecuted, the church grows. Thirdly, why is the church awesome? The church is God's most precious possession on earth. You are God's most treasured possession. See in Acts 20, we read this, be on guard for yourselves. He's talking to the elders, talking to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. <clears throat> Peter also later says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your former manner of life, but with the precious blood of the lamb, spotless and without blemish. God has paid an un fathomable price for you and for me who are his precious possession he loves you he I mean he adores you often we start to think well God has to love me because Jesus died for my sin and therefore I found the cosmic loophole I've twisted God's arm he has to let me into heaven and he has to love me but it's a begrudging kind of love that's not that's not true at all. <clears throat> Actually, God's love predates Jesus' coming. In fact, we all know uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that all the believing ones shouldn't perish but have eternal life. We often think that means for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. He loved it so much. Uh, but what he's saying is, in this way, God loved the world. His love predates Jesus coming. God, Jesus comes because of God's great love for you. Because of God's great love for you, Jesus came so that you wouldn't die in your sin. You'd spend eternity with him. He loves you. You're his most precious, prized possession. What isn't the church? The church isn't well, where two or three are gathered. There's the church. Again, uh, shocker of a misreading of a passage that's essentially talking about church discipline and saying, well, where there are more than one witness or where there are people who agree, 
uh, dare I ratify the decision. He's not saying that uh, where two or three are gathered, there's a church. You don't even need two or three to be gathered because remember, the, the church is every single individual who belongs to Jesus throughout the world and throughout time is one of the ways that the church uh, is used. And the church is the gathered church like this. And the church is uh, the, the people who uh, belong to like a geographic region as well. Here's more from the Bible and the church. Colossians 1. He is also the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He is the head. The Bible talks about us like a, like a body and he is the head. So we are united with Jesus. And if we are ever u- not united with Jesus, we are a decapitated body. Gross. Colossians 1, In my flesh I do share on behalf of his body, which is the church. Ephesians 5, No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. He's the head. We are his body. He loves us. 1 Corinthians 12, So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Again, he's trying to show us the unity we have with each other is the same kind as the unity we have in Christ. We are one body. If we are united, if we are united with him, we are a body and a living body. If we are not united with him, we are a dead, decapitated body. If we are united with one another, <clears throat> we are all individually parts of the body. If we are abstract from the body, we are dismembered. Grotesque. I, don't know, I, I have not seen a, like a person with their arm chopped off or leg chopped off. But it's not how it's supposed to be. It, it is injury to both, it's injury to the body and it's death to the limb. Romans 12, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Again, the church is not this abstract institution, organization or body that we come to extract like a mosquito the religious goods and services, the, the pump up and then go about our lives so that we could go to any church really, on online church, uh, in-person church, this church down the road, I go to this church for this need and this church for this need and this thing for this thing and this thing for this thing. That's, like, that's, a, that's something outside the church. That's like a mosquito or a parasite. Tim Keller says the only organism inside the body that's not useful for the body uh, we call a cancer. Just sucks up the nutrients of the body, killing the body and giving life to itself until the body dies and it dies as well. It's only in belonging to the community of Christ, being part of the body, like be, being the body, that we become the body of Christ, we become the church. And so when people come and join a church, like again, that first use of the word uh, church, we join a local church. Um, Yes, it's true. Yes, I am part of the universal church. You are too. I'm part of the the church in Australia or in a geographical region. And we can meet together for like worship nights or conferences or or missional endeavors. It's one of the reasons I love like Encounter Youth, the stuff that they do at Schoolies Week and, um, and Beach Missions. I love those churches coming together, different Christians coming together. Uh, different ministries coming together. Love that. That's not the church. That's, that is a use of the church. That's not the entirety of the church. That can't be th- your church because you're still the mosquito. You're still the dismembered, like the finger trying to come and attach yourself for a day. You sew yourself on and then you undo, like you cut the stitches and come off and try to do your own thing. It's gross. I'm not trying to put condemn, condemnation on anyone. I'm trying to use the Bible's imagery of the body to show what it looks like to be dismembered. And when we scatter, we don't dismember. We're still 
individually members of one another. We still belong to one another. It's one of the reasons we must, like Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We must let our burdens be known so they can be borne by others. Because when one is grieving, the whole body grieves. And when one's celebrating, the whole body celebrates. But this unique ability to grieve and celebrate at the same time, even. <clears throat> and we need to be people who are in community and so united with one another, one another that people trust us with their burdens. Or that we even go seeking how we can support one another. Go to church. I've, I, I've used this just before. Uh, and I, I like to try to add to it each time. Go into church, like abstract, and then come in and, you know, extracting religious goods and services. I'm not talking about visitors. If you're visiting with us today, you're very welcome. Like if you're visiting from another part of something, somewhere else, or uh, you know, we belong somewhere else, or whatever, like you're very welcome here, absolutely. Like please don't be, uh, again, I'm not talking about you guys, obviously. Going to church means just rocking up for the service, and then leaving when the service is done because you've extracted your religious goods and services. But being the church means preparing your hearts before we meet together. It means we don't come for a service. We don't even call these services. We never have. We call these gatherings because this is the gathering of the church. Going to church means coming for that formal hour and a half out of duty. Well, this is what I'm supposed to do. Being the church means enjoying fellowship with one another outside those times. It's not just, again, the body coming together and Frankensteining itself together on a Sunday morning and then whoop, dismembering and you know, pulling all the Lego pieces apart and going about your life scattered, unassociated, unaffiliated, ununited. But rather we come together and gather as the body and scatter. We're still the body that belong to one another. We're still bearing one another's burdens in smaller groups and as individuals. Going to church means noticing a problem and complaining or leaving. Being the church means noticing the problem and finding a solution or at least being part of the solution. Going to church means you attend an organization consuming its goods and services. Being the church means you belong to a family. It's not like going to a restaurant where you pay money, you have this transactional relationship. I pay you money, I, dem- I expect and demand really good service. This has a hair on it, I send it back, complain, leave you a bad review. If you do that at your parents' family dinner, if I do that at my mum's house, it's going to go poorly for me. We're a family. Going to church means you approach church as a consumer. Being church means you approach church as a contributor, part of the body. Going to church means chucking whatever loose change you happen to have on you at the time into a box. Uh, being the church means taking financial responsibility for your community. Going to church means wanting to shape the community to fit you or find one that does. Being the church meaning means having relationships, teaching, accountability, and the discipleship that shapes you. I, I want to be shaped by a community of disciples. I, I am so keen. One of the things I love about being in this community is that my kids are growing up with people like you guys who are forming them and shaping them by your example, by your words, by your life and your doctrine. It's how it's supposed to be. Going to church focuses on a certain repertoire of songs or style of sermon, a feeling you get, an affect. Being in the church means coming to pour yourself out in worship and being filled with joy. Going to church means delegating your spiritual maturity and discipleship to an organization abstract of you. It's their job to disciple me, their job to disciple my kids uh, when my scripture reading is limited to them reading me the Bible. My worship is limited to when I'm in, like standing in, in a pew in a seat and being kind of sung at. That's my worship. Being the church is about each member individually and corporately pursuing Jesus. So we come together, <clears throat> we're doing the same things we're already doing during the week, we're just doing them together. We're gathering our discipleship groups. We're doing the same things we're doing during the week. We're just doing them in community together. Rubbing off, rubbing off on one another. Uh, be, like knitting the, the unity of our lives closer together. Sewing those bonds tighter. 
because we are a body. Going to church is outsourcing your acts of righteousness or care to others or a pastor or a mercy team. Uh, Being the church means actively taking care of those God has put in your proximity. Going to church is about me. Being the church is about us in him. There's a stack more. I have no more time. Being the church is about the people, not about the steeple. It's not about the building, institution, organization, denomination. It's about the body of Christ, knitted together in his love, united even as we're united into the head who is Christ. And like Ephesians 4 tells us, that we'll grow up into full maturity, even being perfect as we become more like the head who is Christ. But we need each other. Jesus said, I'll build my church. It's the one thing he says he's going to do. The one that's like build, build his church. It's where he intends mission to happen. It's where he intends discipleship to happen. It's where he intends worship to happen, family to happen, etc., etc. You might say, well, that, this all sounds like semantics. We're all kind of saying the same thing, but, but we're not. Uh, when we approach church as something abstract of us. If we change our minds and approach church as, oh, this is my, my family, my, my, my other limbs, my other body, my, my, my other parts of my body, we are one in this sense, it radically changes how you view each other. But we don't become obstacles to your comfort anymore. They become the way to you bearing burdens and having your burdens borne. Because otherwise people are just become your obstacles to your ultimate goal, which is your self-fulfillment, your, uh, your preferred affect, uh, molding the world to fit you. Philippians 2, Paul writes, If then there's any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude of that uh, as that of Christ Jesus. I'm saying, don't just try to like will yourself to be better people. Look to the example of Jesus. He goes on to say, who emptied himself for us, who loved us with the greatest of loves, who forgave us before we ever asked for forgiveness, who didn't cling to his rightful throne in heaven to be worshipped but became like one of us even took our sin upon himself even became sin even died a death we deserved even a death on a cross Paul's saying have have the same mind of Jesus he is the head if we're united to him we are united to one another Jesus came to serve and not be served didn't cling to privilege loved the unlovely, died for his enemies, calls us to do the same. I think if we become the kind of church that Jesus is building, that that, that he wants us to be, uh, less people will leave the church. Because we'll be a church where people can bring their struggles they don't have to try to look perfect and if they can't be perfect, well, I can't be around these people. Or if they start to question things, they go, well, I can't look like I'm doubting or questioning things. I can't, I can't bring my questions to this community because I've got to have it all together. I've got to, I've got to go somewhere else. I'll be around other questioning people who are, have a culture that is not pro being a part of a church community. Uh, no, we, we, if we were, if we become that kind of community, united to the head, united to one another. Uh, All those same things we looked at before. Um, Humbly pursuing Jesus and putting sin to death. Uh, Pursuing a kind of culture where 
again, we are the broken, the sinful, but also the saved, the loved, the righteous. At the same time that other people can come in and see not a bunch of wonderful, smiling veneer, but they see all the sin and the struggle and they see the gospel and the spirit at work in us and they say, I too have sin and struggle and here is a community where I can belong. They see transparency, vulnerability, accountability, systems and structures uh, that support all of these things that, we, that we've spoken about. Uh, they'll see the kind of community they don't want to leave and, and run to a place down the road, even if they have preferences. They'll see people who are laying down their preferences, young and old, loud and soft, introverts and extroverts, across cultures, across demographics, coming together because we are united to one another and united to the head. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your kindness to us. You're so good to us. Just all the time. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his love, for your love. That even in our, in our sinfulness, you first came for us, dealt with sin and death, and you draw us to yourself, uh, not based on our righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. Thank you. They don't just love us, but you like us. Help us to receive this love and like, to live in light of it, that it would shape us. And Father, as we approach one another, uh, your church, church universal, uh, church in our geographic region, and in this ch local church, help us to do it in a way that is congruent with the will for us. We know Jesus is building his church, and we want to be built. Father, help us. Not for our glory, not so that we uh, look great, but so that you look awesome as you are. So that others might experience your same love, find the freedom in the gospel of Jesus. Help us to be loving. Help us to be uh, winsome. Help us to lay down our preferences as we're relating with people who have left their church or the church. Uh, help us to paint a better, truer picture of Jesus' church. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.